All right, kids, now is your time to go to children's church where fun will be had by all. Enjoy. We'll see you guys shortly. And if you are staying behind, uh, we're going to have real fun in Luke 24. So you may want to open your Bible there to get us ready. Uh, Mornings like this one are uh, a little bittersweet because today we will finish a book of the Bible that we have spent uh, well over 20 weeks in this year. And and, and as we've been reading it and hearing it together since March, um, when you spend this kind of time in in a book, uh, it, it grows on you. It becomes familiar to you like a, like a, a fond friend. And, and so it's hard to move on, right? And yet, uh, I'm ready to move on as well. I hope you guys are as well. Um, we're going to, to get ready to, to hear and read Lamentations together through Advent. And my prayer is that as we move into Advent, that those scriptures, Lamentations, a, a book we don't read often as the church, um, will have its way in us. And I want to set the stage this morning um, briefly because we are going to pick up right where we left off last week with some women disciples who went to the tomb where Jesus had been laid. And they went there to prepare his body for burial. But instead of finding Jesus in the tomb, they found the tomb wide open and these two men in dazzling appearance speaking crazy talk. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen, these men declare. And the women don't know what to do with this, so they run back to the disciples. And the men cannot believe it either, but Peter has to see for himself, and so he runs to the tomb. He checks it out. He sees the grave clothes, and then he runs, and and he returns. And then finally, we encounter, for the first time last week, the risen Jesus. And we encounter him as two disciples walking home from Jerusalem encounter him. He, he, He joins them on their walk home. But for some reason, they are unable to recognize him, and and, and they're kept from recognizing him. And and so he just walks with them, and he starts talking to them, and he begins talking through the scriptures with them, and they've got seven miles, so they've got plenty to talk about. Uh, And he helps them to understand everything that has happened in light of their scriptures. And then they get to the, the disciples' home, and he takes bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it to them and then they see him. They know who he is. And the disciples do the only sensible thing, which is to turn around and to run seven miles back to Jerusalem in the dark, probably barefoot, it's probably uphill, just to tell the others what's happened. That's the story we heard last week and that is right where we pick up in verse 36 of Luke 24. As the disciples were then talking about all of these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have any of you something to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, 
and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise my fa- of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Do we understand what's happening here? Do we understand what's happening in this passage? And, and here's, where we, here's where we get deep real fast, right? How do we know we understand? Because our passage tells us that this large group of disciples didn't understand. And then they did. This group was made up of both men and women who had been traveling through the countryside with them, some of them coming all the way from the northern region of Israel, the Galilee. And here they are, gathered around him, and and they're kind of freaking out, right? Because they haven't understood what's happening. But the passage goes further. We learn that, that one of the very specific things that Jesus does with his disciples, to his disciples, is open their minds to understand. And so I wonder, I I, I always wonder this, how open are we to the possibility that we have followed Jesus for some period of time, maybe a long period of time, and that we've done so without understanding, or, or at least with minimal understanding? Are we open to this idea? Are we threatened by this idea? Because the disciples here had been with him for some period of time and they didn't understand, but now they do. For instance, as we start thinking about what we may or may not understand, do we understand why Luke decides to finish his epic story about Jesus the way that he does? Jesus, the Son of God who was crucified and was buried and has now been raised from the dead. Why does Luke decide to wrap up his story uh, uh, with Jesus, the resurrected king of Israel, asking for a snack? Right? This is a weird end to the story. Hey, do you guys got anything to eat? Why does Luke who throughout the story has had some really harsh things to say about a place called the temple. And his story about Jesus at the temple, which is actually the very same place where he began the story with a priest named Zechariah. Well, why does Luke tell us that Jesus went up into heaven? Why does he then go through so much effort to let us know that that this isn't just like a a, a wispy spirit Jesus that goes into heaven, but it's a human, physical, snack-eating, flesh and bones, hands and feet Jesus that goes into heaven? And then, do we understand what it means that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, that there with Jesus, the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms somehow now immediately made some sort of new sense. They're then told that they're going to be witnesses of these things. But even here we need to ask, do we understand what the disciples are instructed to actually bear witness to? What does this look like? What does this mean? See, just a matter of days before this, the disciples were pretty sure they knew what was going on, and now they are finally given understanding. Jesus is showing them what they couldn't see before. And so this is the second week in a row that we've read and reflected on passages about the resurrection, but are are going to talk very little about the resurrection 
In fact, for two weeks in a row now, we've, we've talked mostly about the importance of understanding. And, and we've done this because the resurrection is like the punchline at the end of a joke. It's not a joke. It's like, this is an analogy, uh, it's the surprise twist at the end of the movie that suddenly makes you rethink the entire movie that you just watched. From the very beginning of Luke's gospel, he has been pointing his Gentile listeners further back, hinting to them, suggesting, and even outright boldly declaring, if you are going to understand this story, this story about Jesus, this story about resurrection, then you better know what has come before. And so I want to give you an example. And I got this example from Derek, and I really hope you're not planning on using this in an upcoming sermon. But if you do, now you have to credit me. So... Um, <laughs> if, if you've never seen the movie The Sixth Sense, you, you probably know at least something about it. You've heard of the movie and you know that there's something interesting about it because, see, this movie is, has become the classic example of a movie that has a twist at the end that completely changes everything you thought you were watching. See, because some, sometimes you watch a movie, you read a book or whatever, and there's a twist at the end. Often our, our good mysteries have twists, but it's just a surprise that you didn't see coming. The twist at the end of The Sixth Sense reframes the entire movie. It forces you to reconsider every single scene, every single encounter all along the way. It fundamentally changes the movie. So, there are a couple ways that we sometimes tell the story of Jesus. That if we watched the sixth sense that way, would destroy the story. So uh, think about the sixth sense for a, a, a minute with me. Could you imagine walking up to a group that's watching this movie, and you walk up right at the end, just as the main character learns that he's actually been dead through the entire movie. I hope you have seen it. If not, sorry. Ta-da! Oops. Uh, that he's been dead all along. Boom! Right? Mind blown. No, you're, you're not. See, because the twist actually requires the rest of the story. You, you have to watch the movie. You have to watch the character actually speaking and interacting and doing all of the things he does to see just how crazy it is. Yet at the same time, makes total sense that he was dead all along. See, you may know what happened at the end of the sixth sense, but you don't understand it if all you have seen is the end. You can't understand it if all you hear is the punchline. Or, what if you're watching the sixth, then, sixth sense and deciding, I think I know where this movie's going. You decide to turn it off before you get to the end, the, the reveal the results would be really funny and really interesting, right? You run into somebody at work, and the movie comes up, and, and you guys are talking about it, and you just don't understand how they have the reaction that they're, they're going on and on about how great it was and how shocking and how profound, and you're thinking, I mean, it's interesting. But here's what would be crazy about this. One of you would think that this movie was about a, a man helping a boy. And the other of you would think that this movie was about a boy helping a man. You would have two totally, completely different understandings of what this story is about. And so you might know what happens, but you don't understand it. You can't understand it without the punchline. Removing the content that sets up the twist or, or leaving the twist out altogether would lead to an epic misunderstanding of the story being told. And I think this is what we do with the story of Jesus often, far too often. People aren't walking up to us and asking us to tell them the end of the story, but we tend to bring them in at the end of the story. It's like we say to them, 
you have to see my favorite movie. Let's go watch it together. Here, let me fast forward to my favorite part, right? And then we, we show it to them and we say, isn't it great? And they, uh, I don't know. I didn't get to see the, the whole thing. And this is kind of what we do when we start with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead, we declare. Isn't that awesome? We ask them, and we're kind of surprised then when people stare at us and tell us that they, they don't really get it or they're not sure why it's important or they should think about it at all. See, we just told them the punchline of the joke. And then we start to like try to explain to them, well, this is why it's funny. Which, right, have you ever tried to explain a joke to somebody and you just, you just need to give up immediately? But even the Gospels, even the Gospels, if we're honest, aren't the backstory for the punchline, for the twist. The, the, the Gospels are merely setting up the twist. See, the content, the content that is the foundation for meaning and understanding to the twist is found in the First Testament. The law of Moses, Jesus tells us, the prophets and the Psalms. When Jesus opens the minds of the disciples, isn't that a great picture? Like Jesus doing brain surgery, like opening their, but thankfully it's a metaphor. Jesus opens the minds of the disciples. They already have the content there. He's just helping them to see what it means. The story of God, the story of Israel is the story that makes Jesus make any sense at all. Without that story, Jesus doesn't make sense. The result of telling the story this way is that people begin to, to sort of dogmatically declare that Jesus has been raised and you should believe in him. And people ask the appropriate question, why and we don't have an answer. Or our answers begin to sound really bizarre, and you start to wonder if the person actually saw the movie at all. The second thing we do to the story of Jesus is that we leave out the punchline altogether. So it's like we, we try to set up the joke, but we never quite finish it. And again, people are kind of left scratching their heads, trying to figure out what they just heard. Okay, Jesus has died for our sins, but we leave him dead. Or, or like in, in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, right? We, we give the resurrection this cryptic 15 seconds at the end. The sort of like token gesture that really in our minds makes the resurrection just another miracle from the New Testament. But the result of telling the story either of these two ways is that you end up telling a very different story than the one the resurrection demands. The story that we have come to call the gospel. And so we wonder, we ask, how can we know that our mind has been opened to understand the scriptures? And, and there's a couple points of contact, a couple of things for us to look at in our passage, um, a few details to consider. One of those being that Luke makes a pretty big deal about the physicality of Jesus of, and of Jesus' resurrection body. And this shouldn't surprise a, a First Testament reader. See, the Bible opens with a declaration that the earth and all that is in it is good. And whatever sin has done to the physical world, we hear in the prophet Isaiah and in other places some fairly large promises about God's intentions to restore it. And so that, Je that Jesus is raised in a physical body of, of flesh and bones is an important announcement that whatever future God has in store for you, for us, for the world, it is at least a physical one. How do you know someone has had their mind opened to understand the scriptures? Well, how do they talk about the future to come? When they talk about life after death, 
do they talk about some sort of disembodied spiritual existence out there in a spiritual realm of some sort? Do they talk about humans becoming angels or getting wings or, or becoming something other than human? I think these are ideas that are, that are inconsistent with what God has revealed to us and so would suggest that their understanding isn't being shaped by the scriptures. Because instead, Jesus is raised from the dead in a body, and so too will we. Physical bodies on a new physical earth that God will take up as his dwelling place forever. This is the story. There's another detail from our story. The temple, and I brought this up earlier. Do we understand what the point of emphasizing the disciples' return to the temple is all about. Why would Luke give us this detail? Jesus died for us. What good is the temple? And yet the disciples are found there, blessing God. In fact, Acts will pick up and they're praying there and doing the things you do in the temple. But, but maybe it's because being Jewish and following the law isn't now wrong or inappropriate because of Jesus. And we need to be reminded of this. And Luke's first audience, a Gentile audience, needed to be reminded of this. One of the quickest ways to know if you understand the scriptures is to, is to evaluate what you do with Jesus and the disciples' Jewishness. If we want to outright disregard it, we can't understand the story that's being told. Finally, the event in our passage that is commonly referred to as the ascension raises some interesting questions for us. We're told that Jesus is carried up into heaven. So we wonder, why? Why is this described the way that it is? What's happening here? Is this just like the closing act, like the curtain call? Is it like a bonus magic trick at the end? One of the things that we sometimes hear people talk about or say, and, and, and especially... Um, I mean, it depends on where you go, but you, you hear more or less emphasis on it in various places around the world. Um, but there is a intense focus on a figure named Satan or the devil, the evil one, and, and a, a sort of obsession with him and an idea that he is somehow currently the ruler of the world. And I'd like to suggest to you that our passage, the way that it closes, says that that's not true. Uh, whatever power or authority a figure named Satan might have, it is severely limited. But more important, it has to be understood in light of what Luke's gospel is declaring here at the end. When Jesus is carried up into heaven and Jesus is worshipped, we are hearing the picture of Jesus' enthronement. Jesus, a physical human being, has taken his seat at the right hand of God the Father in heaven to rule the world. Jesus is the king. And as Luke has been promising from the very beginning of his story, this gospel, this human king has begun his reign and is reigning now. And it's important for us to get that. See, as a part of the physical world, Jesus goes up into heaven. So too the disciples are waiting for a piece of heaven to come down to the earth. We, we heard in there the hope, the, the, the waiting, the power that the disciples are waiting for will come in the form of God's own spirit. Uh, and so there's going to be a, a bit of earth in heaven and a bit of heaven on the earth. 
And there's a link. There's a, a, a bind, something binding heaven and earth together because what this is doing, what this is announcing is the promise of what is to come, that one day heaven and earth will not just be linked together by God, but that heaven and earth will one day be one. The earth will be the dwelling place of God, that God will make his home among us. This is good news. This is the story. So just based on our passage this morning, these questions, they challenge us to ask the question, do we understand? How much do we understand? Is there more for us to understand? And one of the questions that that leaves open for us is how well do we know the scriptures? So consider your own life, your own knowledge of these texts that we declare God has given us to reveal himself to us. How comfortable and familiar are you with Leviticus or Second Kings, Ezekiel, Obadiah, Song of Songs, Lamentations? Uh, do you know what's in these books? And it's more than just knowing what's in them. Do you know what they are saying about our God? And do you know what they're saying about us and about who we are in relationship to this God who is inviting us to know him? Can we explain how each of these books tells the story of the God of Israel, the God who would become human, who would die on our behalf, would be raised, and then who would ascend to his throne in heaven? I wonder if we've spent too much time getting away with knowing just enough of the story to be dangerous. Growing comfortable with, with caricatures or memory verses or cliches that others have given to us or that just give us glimpses into the story. It's, it's like when we read the Cliff Notes version of the novel so that we can participate in class, but the class discussion's only half an hour, so I don't really have to know it that well. Or uh, it's like when we read the episode recap of a, of a show that we share in common with some people at work because we want to be able to talk about it the next day at the water cooler. Or it's like dinner last night with Rebecca. This is really funny. We pray together as a family, as part of our family worship time at dinner, and we have this cup with sticks in it. And the sticks all have somebody's name on it for us to pray for them. And every night, Beck pulls out a stick, and here's what she does with it. She looks at the first letters of the names, and she sort of confidently blurts out whatever names she thinks they probably are. So last night, uh, John and Carrie stick came out of our thing. And so J and C, Jane and Curtis, we're praying for Jane and Curtis tonight, right? She didn't read them. She could have read them uh, pretty easily, but taking a little bit of information boldly declares the non-truth that those sticks were declaring. Working with partial information, I think we do this sometimes. We confidently pretend to know more than we do. And so let me just confess this to you. There are books of the Bible that I don't know very well. Uh, I get lost in Ezekiel really fast. Uh, but I don't think this disqualifies me from calling myself a disciple of Jesus or talking about God and what God's up to. But it will certainly help me to, to speak uh, more humbly about him. And if a disciple is a learner, if a disciple is a student of Jesus, then, then by recognizing what I, I still need to learn, I can proactively engage the material that I still need to know. I can set out to learn because I know what I don't know. And so if I say that Ezekiel is a piece of God's effort to reveal himself to me, to us, to the church, to the world, then as long as I'm unfamiliar with this text, there's always going to be a gap in my knowledge base. There is scripture that is not in my brain, in my heart, and therefore cannot be understood because I don't know it. And as long as there is scripture that I don't know and therefore I don't understand, there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity to draw near to the Lord, to learn from Jesus to get to know God more and better. 
And so if Jesus were to, to open your mind today, would there be scriptures there for him to help you understand? If your mind were opened, would, would he find the law of Moses in there and the prophets in there and the Psalms in there, passages that you've heard and you've read and you've studied and you meditated on, the very words of God for his people for life, would he find them there so that he might then give you understanding? Because after understanding, he tells us, you will be my witnesses. You will be witnesses to these things. I want to read one more time from Psalm 119. And you can just listen. Um, whoever's going to get the kids, you can, you can do that now. How can a young person keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. What we're going to do in Advent, or what we've created for you for Advent, is a way to give you the backstory. It is a way to at least help you kind of look and find, when we show up on Christmas Eve, and we read in Matthew the story of Jesus' birth. Well, what's the, the stuff that we need to know to make sense of that? And what's interesting is that Matthew, the very first gospel, the bridge between the First Testament and the New Testament, starts out with a bridge. This is the genealogy of Jesus. In other words, in order to understand Jesus, you need to understand at least the story of Abraham through David, the story of David through the exile, and the story of exile to the present. And so what we've done in the Advent booklet for you is we've broken up the weeks based on that story. Uh, for sure, you will not be reading the entire First Testament in the next month, but uh, at a minimum, what it's going to do for you is it's going to give you a piece of that narrative that I think is foundational so that when we begin to hear the story of Jesus and we begin to sing joy to the world, why, why is Jesus good news? And, and I think this is going to be a good adventure for us. And so uh, we are encouraging you and challenging you uh, to take the daily worship guide and to use this together uh, in your home as an individual, however you might use it, uh, have conversations about it, wrestle with it. We expect that there will be questions and other things, and not only are Derek and I available, but board members and small group leaders and, and anybody have conversations about these passages so that this year as we, as we show up together on Christmas Eve and we announce the birth of the King, we, we have some sense of what we are saying and declaring.